Okay, we have now officially started recording these, uh, this episode of the Midweek Howl. I'm Shane. This is, I'm with the Ozark Howler. We're recording this May 1st, and here in Ohio on May 1st, it's like it's November 29th, the weather. So is that cold? If, oh, it sucks. It snowed it. I wore shorts to work today on the mail route, and it started snowing. I had to sit in the truck for a little bit. Until Serious? Yeah. It was terrible. Oh, I was going to explain it was like 59 earlier, and I thought it was chilly here. No, it was rainy, snowy. It's it, Monday at the post office. All the all the things that make being a mailman extra, extra special, you know. But I see the weather's crazy all over the United States. Flooding and tornadoes and just, just a lot of crazy stuff. So I guess I should be glad for just... It's just a little bit cold. Yes, you probably should. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, okay. So I want to start this episode off. I want, we have a loyal, loyal listener. Super you have loyal a, listener. We, we have a loyal listener. We have a loyal, okay. Uh huh. Super loyal. We have many loyal listeners, but this is a loyal listener. She happens to be a mom of a very good friend of mine. And she listens to all the episodes, loves them. She especially loves the Howler episodes. She thinks you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, mm-hmm. She she and her husband, as they retired, they live now in Greenville, South Carolina. Right. Which is, I hear is a beautiful place. I'm hoping, I, I just, in fact, told Christy, I said, when we go down to visit my daughter, we're going to try to swing by and see them this summer. Okay. But she is taking, she wanted me to tell you, she's taking a special forces class at Furman University with with Green Beret instructors, apparently. Yep, okay. So, while I don't really know what that would entail, I thought maybe you would have some solid insight, maybe even some insider information we could pass on to Marion since she might be able, that she could go and impress the, impress the people there. If they're Green Berets, they can't be impressed. <laughs> okay, that's it. Sorry, Marion, you're out of they can't be impressed. Unfortunately, they are in some ways polar opposite of the other direct action combat troops, the Navy SEALs. Okay. Because normally when you, I don't want to categorize, there's a lot of Navy SEALs out there with talk shows, with books, and tridents on all their clothes, right? Yeah. A lot of them in Congress. The Green Berets traditionally have been known as the quiet professionals. Okay. Or the gray man, they they are they are not known for their bravado. Interesting, interesting. And, and, and they're well, they're more of a full force multiplier. You know, back in the old days, the thing that that got that that you know when you hear about Navy SEALs getting washed out because of Hell Week or laying in the in the you know everybody sees the movies where they're laying in the uh, the surf. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the yeah. old days, the Green Brace, what washed them out was their uh, aptitude. You you had to, um, I'm trying to remember, they, they had a college requirement early on. You had to be on your second enlistment. So you couldn't just join and, and, and apply for SEAL training like you can at the Navy. You had to have already done four years in a, generally a combat MOS, like an infantry or some kind of a, uh, a job like that. So, but the Green Berets that did come out of the program were seasoned already. And see, they, they have an educational background. Um, I do, we do, you do. So they go and teach an indigenous population to uh, uprise against their government and stuff like that, right? So okay. they're not going in so much to, you know, to kill Osama bin Laden as they are to go in there and recruit you know, 15 or 20 du- dudes or, or maybe a whole city eventually to overthrow uh, the government. Interesting. So they're, so they're doing it more um, behind the scenes than, than, than in front of the, in front of the scenes combat wise. Well, they are probably the number one killers in the military without a doubt. You know, the, the A team being Delta force. But the blood's not all in their hands. They're what what they're trying to do is, you know, they go in. If you you've seen thirteen strong, right? Yeah, twelve strong. 
So those guys went into Afghanistan and linked up with the local warlord, and and those twelve brought along a hundred natives, that sort of thing, as opposed to sneaking in and doing it by themselves with a giant quick reaction force behind them. So it seems to me like like Marion, she's very cunning and smart. Okay? Well, I'm, I'm trying she to figure might... out what kind of class is it. What are they teaching? I don't know. She didn't the history really, of them. She didn't, she didn't she really needs to watch the John Wayne movie, uh, Green Berets. That's where I learned everything I know. <laughs> That's where you learned everything you know. Like, like I know Marion's a big pickleballer. Okay, so I can see that she would be. She'd sit back, survey the situation, and then probably slice you and dice you to pieces on the pickleball court. Much the same way she's maybe she's the green beret of pickleballers. I don't even know how to play pickleball. I don't either. And I, I thought I looked at something the other day. Maybe it was cricket. I was watching something. Is it cricket where they bounce it off the ground? Like what they got the pe- like uh, where like the matches. The pitcher. The matches last forever. It's like a wicket and and a stick. And they they're, they're okay. Pickleball is a racket or paddle sport where two players. So pickleball looks like it's almost like tennis. With a racquetball? Maybe. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like something I couldn't do. She must be in great shape. She's still in great shape? Oh, yeah. She's in good shape. She's she's in her... Well, I don't want to say her age. She's old enough to have been retired for a while. <laughs> so, well, so she's a good money manager. That could be uh, could have been us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but I'd never be able to beat her in pickleball. I can tell you that. You know, half the cricket stuff I see is... Uh, is um must be popular in India. Yes, cricket is a big, big. But isn't it what they bounce? They bounce it off the ground. Yeah, yeah. that yeah, looks crazy hard. And, yes, yeah. Somebody's, pit- but like some of those cricket matches last like forever, and I don't even understand. I mean, Do they have a pitch clock like the like the MLB. I don't. Apparently not. I mean, I don't know. I just remember. Um, reading stuff about the cricket matches lasting days or something. And I don't even know what a match consists of. What are you I mean, talking about days? Like a day? Like 24 hours? Oh, come on. Like they restart it the next day or they run all night? Oh, my God, I'm going to look just because you said, oh, so now they got cricket. Um, uh, well, let me just see. I'm going to look up longest cricket match. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was days right here. The longest cricket match in history went on for an incredible 12 days. And where was that at? Um, And it ended without a winner. The test match between England and South Africa took place in 1939. That's probably because half the time they're waiting for the lights to come back on. (laughs) Beginning of Friday. Tough neighborhood nowadays. it, It continued for 43 hours and 16 minutes. The match saw a total of 50. 447 balls bowled, so that's what's called bowl. You bowl the balls, and 1,981 runs. What's the fastest pitch on there? Because I think it's like super fast, isn't it? I, I don't know. Um, I don't even. South I mean, Africa I was, was three. On. I did three baseball games at a tournament on Saturday, and I'm telling you, after 12 hours of being in the wind at a baseball tournament, I was done for. So, God bless those guys. Is there is there a time limit in cricket? Seventy five minute time limits. Uh, I don't even understand. This is they might as well be bowling teams are forced to complete their twenty overs, which I don't even know what an over is in this within seventy five minutes. See, Example, that's why those games three, can't. That's that's why those games can't make it in America, right? I know we have some European listeners, certainly some British listeners, and. <sighs> Not now, but 50, 60, 75 years ago, when the sun wasn't sitting on the British Empire, most Americans could not grasp the complication of those games. I'm just going to leave it at that. No, no. I mean, you've got to think that hard to explain it to me. You know know what I mean? What would a coal miner in Mingo County, West Virginia do? (laughs) We're going to go out here and play baseball or we're going to go play cricket, squash. What was the other one? Badminton. No, what would you croquet. say? Croquet. Croquet. Any, any of them. Any of them. Any of them. They would say, we're going to die of black lung before this game is over. 
True. I mean, Jesus. True. True. I don't even, I mean, I'm looking at stuff where they're scoring 800 runs in a day. And, I, you're, I don't a, even and you're a sports guy. You I, know? Don't even, I don't even get it. I have no, and it's terrible. I mean, I'm sure if maybe if I looked at it, and but it just boggled my mind right now to even understand. So I think what happens is. I can is, feel it through, the, through my headphones. That's yeah, I think I what happens that. is you, you get up there and maybe you never, maybe the skill is, is that you never get out or what we would call out. And you just keep hitting the thing and it keeps going. I, don't I know. mean, it sounds way too complicated for my ancestors. I, yes, I agree. I agree. And I, you know, and, and I enjoy baseball. I, you know, my grandpa was a great baseball player. And I, I don't even know that it would resemble baseball enough to, you know, but maybe that's what, maybe that is, man, see, I'm just open a can of worms. Maybe that's what Abner Doubleday. Guy who, you know, who created baseball. Maybe he saw cricket. This stuff's taking too long. Let's let's make a derivative of it and come up with baseball. Maybe that's what. Maybe you know, he didn't like curling. He didn't like cricket, and he figured out maybe I can combine some stuff. I don't know. I mean, as a kid, I remember the first time I saw curling. Um, like I was this. forty years old the first time I saw it. So I don't know what you're where you grew up at. But what do you mean you? The first time I ever saw curling was um, every once in a while when the weather was good, we'd be able to get a Canadian channel over the antenna where I lived. And and I remember watching this like I had no concept of what they were doing, but they were throwing something out there. And I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. These guys out there were with brooms sweeping back and forth. I'm like, what are they doing? But I had no concept. I was probably 10, you know, and it took a while for I, you know, over the years figured out what it was and the skill it took, you know, to sweep or don't sweep or, you know, to it's kind of like shuffleboard, right? That you play in the bars where you throw that thing down there and try to knock other people's things off. I mean, right? It's just shuffleboard. I guess. Yeah, I don't know. When somebody said, hey, you know, have you ever watched hurling? Curling. What this called? Curling. I yeah. said, yeah, all the time when I was in high school, I had to hold her hair while she was puking, right? And they said, no, curling, not hurling. And I said, no, then I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but <clears throat> probably when I lived in Minnesota, because there's no ice in Missouri, really, to think of. Certainly none you could walk out on. I remember the first time there was, when I moved to Minneapolis in 2000, the winter of 2002, there was a news report that said the first uh, uh, ice victim of the year. And it was a poor guy that went out to ice fish. You know how they try to get out there early on the, before it's really iced over. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then within a day or two, another guy drowned. And I remember talking to a friend of mine, a coworker who grew up here. And I said, hey, what's the deal with these dudes falling off through the ice? And he goes, well, you know, it happens every year. They want to be the first ones out there. And I said, dude, I can't believe it. And he goes, Oh, sure, they got to fall, you know, in that in, in Norwegian accent. Surely they fall through the ice where you're from. And I said, no, they teach us to stay the hell off of it. I don't never, you know, maybe once every three years somebody falls through. But it's a kid. It's not a freaking grown man, 50 years old, going out there with a bucket and a fishing pole. <laughs> no, they don't go out on that ice. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand the fascination of sitting on ice and fishing. Like, well. Now, to, to their defense, I do. I've been ice fishing. I do kind of like ice fishing. But is it? Are you sitting out there? I mean, you're covered. Like you got a little stove in there. Yeah, in an ice house. Yeah, you know, some guys. I've been in some pretty palatial ice house. And they have the game on. They'll be watching the Vikes play. You know, and and mm-hmm. yeah. So it's not Why like not? you're. Hey, look, out I don't. Here, out, out, on the farm, out on the farm, they uh, those guys like to go. They'd like to go up ice fishing, and they had. So they started, you know, because my stepdad knows guys, if you tell them they can't do something or ask them if they can try it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. So they built, they started building some ice shanties, some real oh, nice yeah. ice shanties for people. And uh, somebody so, bought one, turned it into the uh, ticket booth at the uh, Lake County Fair. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, some of them get pretty, pretty handy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. 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 You know, speaking of that, if you got, if you got any customers that can reach out to you, I've got one, maybe two augers, hand augers. Oh, to cut through the ice. Inch, right? I'm going to give them to whatever listener wants them. 
Really? There it's a giveaway. Go. Yep. My there two, they're clam brand, I think, or ice. Uh, they're, they're the blue ones, and I think they're either, they're, uh, they might be the same size. You know we got some Canadian listeners. That's and okay. Be I'll ship all over that. Just tell them, tell, you know what I mean? That they're, they're, oh, yeah. That's their door prize. I'm going to give them the official because they, they, I'm not using them here in the Ozarks. Did you see the, uh, there was an article I retweeted the other day about the, um, they called it the Swedish death giveaway was recommended for, I read the, the British s- newspaper. So, you know, the Swedish, what, what, you've what got it? to look through this. This is a, this is a, this is a prism of of imagination when I'm telling something. Remember okay. that. Because right. I'm, I'm here in the Ozarks reading a British newspaper, and it said the Swedish giveaway is recommended. And apparently in Sweden, a lot of the older people give away a bunch of this stuff so it doesn't burden the children or grandchildren having to get rid of this, everything. This is and your version of toward, the Swedish. Yeah. It was geared toward, you know, Oh, you know, a bunch of old clothes and stuff. And, and and I really, I touched on that because, you know, me and my dad and brothers had to go through my brother when he passed. Now his was an end. I mean, his really wasn't planned. You know what I mean? Uh, <clears throat> so that's, 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 that, that accumulates with that. <clears throat> I can't, I've got so much stuff in my office here. I can't, I can barely, I've got enough room to walk through to my gun safe, to one gun safe, not the other gun safe. And, and there's enough room for me to walk through here and a dog to lay at my feet. Just one dog. I can't have both of my dogs here. One of has got to lay outside. <clears throat> and I've decided to just to, and it's, it, it, it looks like a Cabela's truck crashed into a Bass Pro truck, uh, <laughs> which continued through the side of a Walmart. So... <laughs> So we're going to start doing a Swedish death. I'm looking right here, and I'm not making Ozark this up. I'm, I'm going to count them. Hey, I'm going to count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got seven BB guns or air rifles, combinations within within six feet of me. Why? I, because Why? I because I acted like a child into my fifties, and I had money, so. I bought BB guns. I've got six or eight four tens. If people are, I'm gonna probably keep them. But <laughs> I got a samurai sword, three bows, two crossbows. I got an English longbow here. I probably got uh, at least 150 arrows of different sizes. Just right, just just right here in my office. <laughs> uh, I don't even have an office. I'm gonna send you yeah, a I'm picture. So hey, I'm gonna so send you a picture of of what my office looks like, and I want you to post it on whatever you post, okay? All right, I'll put it up tomorrow. Now, this is from my desk looking back. Okay. Okay. So we're going to, so we're going to, you to remember. So weekly, just, I'm going to give stuff out of my, out of my out of your office, office or stuff. garage away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this week, the first prize is the ice auger. The ice auger, maybe two. If I can find both of them, you're going to get both of them. Mm-hmm. All right, and you're going to ha- so you're going to have to autograph them before you send it. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I will. Yes, it's a small right. price to pay and, for somebody to take my ice auger. And I'm, and I'm going to, I'm going to write down on this piece of paper. I think I know who will, who will, uh, who will try to claim the ice auger first. So that's, uh, so I'm going to write it down. We'll see if I'm right. I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> But I know he'll be listening, and I know, and I bet he sends me a message first. Okay. Says, and I've already got the second. I've already got the second week's gift right here by my hand. I'm going to wait. I can't announce it until next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so stay, stay tuned. So stay tuned. It is a. It is a fishing. There's two things, and they are fishing related. I was going to give them away to a one-legged guy I went to high school with, but I haven't seen him, so I'm going to give them to whatever listeners listening. Oh. No, wait a second. A one-legged guy you went to high school with? He had both legs when I went to high school with him. I was... <clears throat> God, do we want to go down this store? How do we go down this rabbit hole of one-legged? So... Last week was wooden legs. This is one leg. So this is... We've already we've already progressed. So last I was going to get into... 
See, now the problem is I can't tell the story without telling what this second week get. Okay, we're going to double them up this week. We're going to have double gifts. This first week is going to be double gifts. I've got two sinker molds here. I've got a De Palmer manufacturing from Renton, Pennsylvania. Um, they are, it's a lead jig mold. It's a lead sinker mold. It goes three quarter ounce, one and a quarter ounce, one and three quarter ounce, one and a half ounce, and one and five eighths ounce lead sinker mold. And the other one is a big sinker mold. I don't even know how big these things are. They are big. Probably like, like commercial fishing. Yes, like three. The second mold is big. Probably, I don't even know. I could probably weigh them. I'm going to take a picture of them. I don't have a picture of the ice auger. I got a picture of the sinker molds here. So <clears throat> I was going to, when I moved back down here, I kind of think I kind of told the story when we had the monster fish guy on. When I, 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 I kind of picked where I live now based on what to do when I retired. I don't got my message back. I'm going to have to walk out where I got a signal to send them to you. Okay. So <clears throat> I was going to go snag and, and oh, you, know, yeah, you go yeah, out yeah, there with a big, yeah. big, big line and big sinker and you drop it down and you drag around it and, and hope you catch this fish, right? And it's a lot of work, and I really envisioned getting my maybe my teenage boys involved, get them away from the computer, and get them into snagging. And it's just a hell. So I started buying equipment because that's what you do. And I bought a bunch of I got a bunch of big new snagging poles, and I got these. So I couldn't. I went out, and I, I don't remember if COVID had started. I couldn't find any big sinker molds. And then I find out if you find sinkers, they're super expensive. And on and on and on. So what I decided to do is I got on eBay and I bought these sinker molds. And I got a bunch of wheel weights from a garage that my dead brother used to work in. And I'm going to make some wheel weights. So, of course, I can't lead, melt lead. So I had to give these sinkers to my, the, the, the molds to my father-in-law who, who gives, you know, molds me a half a dozen each one, right? And I never, that was three years ago, and I've never went snagging. And fast forward a friend of mine i went to high school with we were talking about this guy let's call him steve and my my classmate says well you know he lost his leg i said no he said yeah i think he lost his leg and i thought oh that's you know and i was gonna look him up he was a cop when i was a cop he was in, he was in a different county and and when i was a state trooper anyway i'd seen not quite a bit but quite you know some so <clears throat> Fast forward a month or so ago, me and a good friend of mine from high school was eating lunch, and I said something about snagging. He goes, oh, man. He said, <clears throat> Steve took us. And I said, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, how did you ever hook up with him? And he said, well, I Googled up fishing guides, and his name popped up, and I thought, surely he can't be the same Steve we went to school with. He said, nope. I called him up, and yep, it's him. And he was a cop. He lost his leg on a motorcycle off duty, so he couldn't be a cop no more. So he he I think he had a little bit of money from the death of his 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 uh his he was raised by his grandparents. It was kind of one of those checkered pasts that are so common today, but in the seventies and eighties it was odd. So his his grandpa left him uh, a house and a little money and a little place on the lake, and he turned into a professional fishing guide. So he said, whenever I want to go fishing, I just call Steve. Now, when I want to go snagging, he's got the boat, he's got the, the, the rods, he's got everything, and he's got a great big, you know, like a sideband sonar screen. You find the big fish on the screen, and within 30 minutes, you're limited out, which is why I decided not to go, because that's really not sporting. You know what I mean? I thought we would toil yeah. for hours <clears throat> <laughs> reeling and pulling and snagging and reeling and pulling and snagging and if you did win if you did get one it was you felt like atlas holding the world you know what i mean unfortunately <clears throat> technology has has killed that too So has has ruined fishing, right? It has ruined the buildup 
of the trip. I've got a book a, called the, a I've got a book and not catch anything. Right? I've got yeah. a book. Well, I've got a book of of the greatest hunting and fishing uh uh not stories ever told. That was one, but it's not that one. It's a different one. And, and it's essentially it's a book about different things, right? Some of these guys, it, it, most of the great stories were in the, you know, from about 1910 to the early seventies, late sixties, right? So you had a transportation, a car or a train or a float plane that can get you out there, but you, you didn't have a GPS. You didn't have a cell phone. You didn't have anything, right? So guys would save up all their vacation or save up some money and go get in a station wagon and make a trip of going to Canada or one of these places. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So it was the lead up of, of, of going, you know what I mean? It was almost as much fun or, you know what I mean? So, <clears throat> Anyhow, it's kind of rented for me to be able to just go out there and turn a thirty-five hundred dollar graph on in a fifty thousand dollar boat and say, "There's the fish are." Drop the sinker and we're going to snag them and go back go to eat because you know uh, those big fish are trying to catch some of them 50, 40, 50, 60, 90 years old, right? And and yeah, I'm it just, doesn't seem know, it doesn't seem fair. They've eluded everything for that long, and then you're yes, like, it would be like some twenty-two year old redheaded vixen that owns a liquor store coming in and poaching me. I mean, it just, it would not, it would not, it just is not the same, right? So it's, it's way too easy. Yes. Way so easy. it's, it's like killing an elephant. You know, when I was young, I would read about the people that went out and did the, the, you know, again, great British empire guys going out <clears throat> on foot and, and big game hunting and big and, game hunting, yeah. especially, you know, elephant stuff like that in, through technology and poaching and different things, they, they, it, it, the big elephants are gone for starters. And the ones that are there, you know, I don't know if I would want to kill a 50 year old pachyderm when I'd kill the shit out of snakes or ground warthogs or something like that. But to kill a big old elephant or a rhino just doesn't have it for me. Well, this makes you feel any better. Did you see the story about the bass fisherman who would have won the tournament in Texas uh, last week? Uh, it was a hundred thousand dollar tournament. He didn't have his fishing license in Texas, so he so he was disqualified. Well, he's an idiot. It has his own fault. <laughs> like I, I wouldn't even think. I wouldn't even think about that. Like you'd have to have a fishing license in the state where you're at for a professional tournament. I would think that would be. Oh my gosh! Yes, these game wardens don't screw around, dude. Even for a professional, it doesn't matter. Fishing. They 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 they. <laughs> <laughs> they don't mess around. The game wardens are a whole different, you know. Well, it, wasn't the game, it wasn't the game wardens. It was the people that run in the tournament. Oh, so the then it was a money deal. In that case, it was a money grab. They just wanted to yeah. screw the guy, give a reason not to pay him. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, that would be the worst. But it was so probably he, in the rule book, wasn't it? Yeah, he said, he said he didn't fill out everything he needed to online to get his license. He filled out most of it, but he didn't. He didn't get it all filled out, so that would just be t just be awful. <laughs> well, oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! And it won't happen again. Uh, I would. I would hope not. I would hope not. You know. So, so you haven't run. So you haven't run into Steve, the one-legged guy. I haven't. This. No, I haven't. You know, I've got a, a dozen Steve stories, but I'm not going to tell any of them here. Uh huh. Not right now. Maybe you know. I almost told one a second ago on accident. And I decided <laughs> not to. The last second. <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to make a note. Let's see. We need Steve. We need to remind you to tell some Steve stories. No, we, hey, yeah, we give we give nickname Cooter. You gotta say Cooter stories because that's what we give him a nickname. Okay, Cooter. Cooter stories. Like from the like from the uh, Dukes of Hazard Cooter. Dukes of Good. Was mm -hmm. he like Cooter? I, no, he didn't. He, you know, I don't know if he knew we called him that behind his back. <laughs> he don't even know. That, all, even better. And that's because somebody, I can't say his last name. There was a dude we worked with that mispronounced his name. Oh, okay. okay I got you. I got you. And, and we were making fun of our co-worker because two of us went to high school with him and we knew exactly how to say his name. 
And then you. after that, we that was our not necessarily our inside joke. He was a canine handler, okay. And back when law enforcement was aggressive, and you thought there was drugs in the car, and you needed a canine, you could call him. You know that was our big thing. Get Cooter's dog because he was an excellent canine handler. He had an excellent dog, and it 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 caught a lot of people. Now, not necessarily my people because I was never aggressive. Uh, you know, I've said it many times. I just wasn't that successful in 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 offensive law enforcement, right? Because you know, I just I, I believe people have freedoms in this country to to drive down the highway, and as long as they're minding their own business, not breaking the law, hauling a machine gun or a load of dope, as long as they didn't get out of line, it's their own business what they got in that car. You know what I mean? I didn't search cars. I didn't. You know, you had to really screw up to 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 suffer my wrath. You know what I mean? Yes, and which. Which you say that, and um, I don't know how I'm going to I'm going to make this segue, but I saw last month there was an, a movie coming on Netflix, is an old one that I love I've loved since I was a kid, and I couldn't wait for it to come on. So, I can, in fact, when we get done here, I'm, I'm going to go and watch it tonight. And they showed a preview of American Graffiti. I'm sure mm-hmm. you've seen it, and it's. And just like you said, aggressive policing. The guy, um, cop, has Milner, right? The guy driving the car with the, the, the McNichols girl and the passenger that's not old enough, underage, right? Is that her name? McNichols? I guess. I don't know. The girl from one of Mackenzie, or is it Phillips? Mackenzie Phillips. Phillips, uh-huh. Mackenzie that's Phillips. probably right. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and the cop's t- saying, you know, Milner, we know it was you. Yeah, but I'm going to let you go this time because I want to catch you in the act and really throw the book at you, you know, because he was drag racing or something like that. I'm like, I thought, there you go. That's aggressive policing. Going to let him go, even though he knows he's guilty because he wants to catch him doing something worse. And he's going to well, be yeah, well, Guess what like, happens is he clogs up. So, so back to the back. It's hard for me. You know, I was trying to tell my kids this one day. It's hard for me to explain. I mean, I, I, I 30 years, right? I started law enforcement 31 years ago next month, okay? And and to the great feats that I saw grown adult law enforcement officers go to bust a dude with a bag of weed is just would be un- I mean if if you if I made a movie out of some of the shit I saw back in them days, people nowadays would think it was some kind of skit. You know, the National Lampoons <laughs> decide they're going to come out with something new, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Gotcha. Because it just, it just. But that, but it wasn't that, that was the focus, right? Oh my gosh. Yes. When, when I just, yes. George H.W. Bush's war on drugs and, and yes. Uh-huh. You also had a war on uh, rap lyrics too, I think, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. N.W.A. F. the police. Yes. Yes, <laughs> I remember. I remember going to my alma mater as a deputy because they have homecoming there, and it's all hands on deck when it's Lincoln's homecoming. Google up Lincoln University, Jefferson, City, Missouri. It's a historically black college university, and let's just say the homecoming crowd sometimes can be rather rambunctious, especially back in them days. Right? Mm-hmm. It would really. I mean, you want to talk about American graffiti. If if a guy could sit down and write a a screenplay that was a place like that in 1992 or 93, that was at the height of the, uh, dare I say, crack days, right? When you had 19, 20-year-old kids with five cars, two houses, and $250,000 in their trunk of a of a 78 Monte Carlo with 20 inch chrome wheels, hydraulics jacked up six feet off the ground, painted, you know, lime green with gold flake on it with gold wheels. The wind is tinted out and he's wondering why you stopped him, you know, and, <laughs> and, and every cop would be like Jack. Uh, wasn't Jack Webb just the facts? Who was the, was it? Oh, you know who I'm talking Joe, about? Joe Friday, Joe Friday. Yes, every every manager in law enforcement, half the managers in law enforcement, either looked like Colonel Potter back then, or Magnum PI. 
You know what I mean? That's what you had. You were either going to be a Colonel Potter or Magnum PI. You know, <laughs> that's quite. That's quite. A, that's quite a spread. Quite Let's a throw somebody else in. I'm trying to think of who a good weightlifter is. <laughs> I can't think of who was the guy. Not Lou Ferrigno. Arnold. Eh, not quite Arnold. More of a, more of a soft weightlifter. You know, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> I went. I was in cop with some big dudes, man. Big dudes. So, yeah, I mean, you remember the 80s, right? So there was a lot of guys that looked like late 80s, early 90s. They were Brian Bosworth that flunked out of college, and their uncle was a fireman, so they got him on the police department or something like that. You know what I mean? I don't know, I don't know how else to say it, right? Shit like that. Uh-huh. And heaven help you. Heaven help the, you know what I mean? If you got on the wrong end of Brian Bosworth. Yes, because you don't know. You know, I think I've told the story about the first domestic I ever went to, right? Is this the one where the guy broke the casserole dish on the sidewalk? The girl, yes, yes. <laughs> uh huh. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So, so. And he was a football player. The guy was, was a football player. He was player. A, the son. Yeah, and, and the cop I was riding with played with his big brother. Uh huh. And this dude got on the dope, and you know, hey. You know, we're going to take care of you. But it's, at the same time, you know, it's 50-50. I worked with a dude, he's dead now, named Don. And he was the interdictor of the year for as a state trooper for a lot of years, right? And when I say interdictor, back in those days, if you get a guy to tell you honest, he'd tell you from about 84 to 96, 7, 8, right? Before New Jersey cracked down on the... Um, when they got jacked up over the profiling, right? So okay. in the eighties, if you were, he would tell you in the eighties, if you were a during the Pablo Escobar times, right? The DEA come in and taught all these guys how to spot these loads of dope. So if you were a if you were a Hispanic male between eighteen and thirty, driving a Olds Delta eighty eight from Arizona or Florida or one of these places, they were going to find a reason to stop you. That's just the way it was. You know what I mean? So I believe, yeah, I believe it. And 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 because of that, he would get when I say tons, you know, he was telling me we got to talking, and he said, you know, that I I was passed over. I was a corporal. And I got passed over for sergeant a half a dozen times, and 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 I said, how is that? Because when I was in college, and then when I was first law enforcement, this dude was the stud interdictor, and I worked with him in investigation unit. I said, why did you ever come off the road? And he said, well. He said the wheel spin. So what happened is in your your promotional test was a part of it's a written test, and the written test is broke down in thirds, right? Need to know, nice to know, and trash. So you get to take his test, and you don't know what's on it. So one thing is you you really need to know, and one thing you should know, and one thing is just crap. So that was one portion. Another portion is your captain got to that was a wheel spin. So. I think there was 30 points on the captain and he had to give somebody 30 and somebody one and he can give anybody in between whatever he wanted. Right. So, and then your supervisor got to give you some points. Well, he was telling me that his supervisor zeroed him out like three years in a row. And I said, why in the hell would he do that? And he said, you know, he told me I didn't write any stop sign tickets. And I said, I beg your pardon. And he said, yeah. And I think his last year on the road was, 2000 and no, it was probably 96, five, six, seven, eight, something like that. And he said, I, I seized in a, in a 365 day period, I seized over $2 million in cash, over 2000 kilos of cocaine and over 6,000 pounds of marijuana in Cooper and Howard County, Missouri on interstate 70. Right. So that sounds like a hell of a lot of stuff to get off the street. Right. Uh, But when he came to his promotion, his sergeant said, yeah, but you didn't write any speeding tickets, you didn't, and you didn't write any stop sign tickets. <laughs> but you got all that dope. <laughs> yeah, so so you had guys that were just the, the 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 one of the paths to promotion is just go out there and write. Sit outside the you know I worked with a guy that sit outside of brick. So there was a highway that there was three refractories on that made fire brick, you know, national refractory, AP green and something else. And he would sit out there depending on, you know, three to 11, 11 to seven and seven to three. He would sit out there at three, 11 or seven. Okay. And write dudes going to a brick plant at, 
you know, ten mile, everybody ten miles an hour go, got, a, got a ticket, and it's, it was a 55 road. He come right off the interstate and it went to a 55 road almost immediately. And I sit out there with him one night, and he was writing this dude a ticket. And I said, Ronnie, I said it's freaking August. It's 106 degrees still, and they're going to work in a in a fire kiln. You know what I mean? In a brick plant making fire brick, and you're writing these dudes a ticket for going 66 on 55. They already hate life. And yes. now they're going to work for the next And there's like, hours. and you know how it is. So, he, you know, and it was like a big caprice. I still remember it was light blue caprice from the 80s. And it was like five dudes in it going to work, you know, with their all with your lunch buckets. You know how they guys used to do that. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he's like, well, you know, you're for the law or you're against it or some bullshit like that. And, and God bless you. I couldn't do it. You know, if anybody give me half, halfway excuse whatsoever, I let them off. So, Back to this dude, he said when he got passed over the last time, he knew he was going to put in to get off the road and, and go do something. So he said he's working out there, and he stops a kid, I think from California or Arizona, going to Chicago. And he says he tells right off the bat, sums up, the kid's hinky, you know, he's nervous as hell. I don't remember that he, that he didn't own the car. He knew the person owns the car, maybe the last name and not the first name. He got a little screwed up about three times in the story. You know what I mean? So Don says he had him back here and he said, hey, this is the deal, son. I don't know what, you know, I don't really know where you're going, but I know what's going on. So if you just tell me where the dope is, I'll just write you a ticket for it and you can go home. And the kid goes, do what? Because I guess the kid had told him because Don had started with small talk. Hey, where are you headed? What's going on? And he apparently had just gotten married. And Don said, well, this is the deal. If you just be honest with me and tell me where the dope is. Because he's burnt out because he did all this work to get all this dope for the last five, six, seven years. And then they're not promoting him because he's not writing enough speeding tickets or stop sign tickets. Right? So he just tells this kid, he says, if you just tell me where the dope is, because if I have to call a dog, I will. And then we'll have to crawl around that car, or, you know, and and if you, if you make us go through all that, I'm going to put you in jail. <laughs> and he said the kid, just, he hung his head. Don says when he hung his head, I knew I had him. And he said, it's in the trunk. And Don said, well, how much, what is it? And he goes, I don't know. And he goes, well, how much is it? And he said, I don't know. So Don said he went over there and opened the trunk and there were 17 pounds of marijuana in there. Holy smokes. Isn't that, isn't yeah. that a lot? So 17 pounds of marijuana in 1996 was a shitload. I mean, now they would call it personal use, but I don't know. <clears throat> so true to his word, he gets his ticket book out and he writes his kid. So the kid says, hey, they were giving him, I don't remember, 5000 or 10000 or whatever to just drive it to this address and walk away from the car. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You don't really know who's a lot of times in them situations. You don't know whose dope it is. You don't know whose car, you know, if you're lucky, you know whose car it is. So that way, if you do get stopped, you you know, you can kind of half-ass tell somebody. But so he wrote this ticket out that said possession of marijuana and then, and then let the guy drive away. Seize the marijuana, let the guy drive away. So a little later, you know, that week or whatever, the, the, between the evidence guy and his sergeant, somebody called him and said, hey, um... I think he said, hey, i got to run this evidence down from that kid for that marijuana possession. And they said, well, how much is it? He said, 17 pounds. They go, holy cow, 17 pounds. Didn't you arrest him? And he said, no. I just wrote him a ticket. And his sergeant, the one that didn't get him promoted for the stop sign, he said, what the F are you doing, Don? You're supposed to, you know, how do you know he's ever going to come back for court? You know, 17 pounds. And Don said, well, you're the one who told me just the other day that, you know, drugs weren't that big a deal. <laughs> hey, and you know what he said? The kid showed up. For a speeding ticket? For the marijuana, 17 pounds of marijuana oh. ticket. Oh, he just gave, oh. He just wrote him a ticket. No, because you could, because just like a misdemeanor. So you, so you could write a ticket for possession of marijuana, and it was coded. You could either code it as a felony under 35 grams or felony over 35 grams. Mm -hmm. Normally, when it was a felony, you took him to jail and made him bond. Do you understand that process? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that. no, he just wrote possession <laughs> of marijuana over 35. So... When they looked at the ticket, they said, well, how much over was he? He said, 17 pounds. Said, what? Where's he at? I let him drive back. He, had, he just got married and had to get back to his wife. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the From the Shadows podcast. 
Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are out. Ha 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 ha.